So I'm going to talk about my first-hand experiences as the recipient of prisoner support and a little bit about doing time, see how much I have time for. No pun intended. Um, this, so I'm, well, I'm going to start with prisoner support and why it's important. And I think I'm going to try to talk about things maybe some people don't really think about when it comes to prisoner support. Um, <coughs> the support I received when I was in prison is just like beyond measure. Um, I am just extremely grateful to, for the support that I got. Um, I was talking last night um, to somebody about this, and we were talking about how you know going to prison, you really see the best in people and you see the worst in people. Um, worse than people uh, in the, some of the people you're with in prison, but some of the, most of the staff. Um, and then the best of the people are just in the support that you receive now. People really come through for you. Um, we really take care of our own. Um, and so I always say this when I get up here, I feel obligated. You know, thank you. If anyone here supported me in any way, I really cannot thank you enough. Um, I feel like it's my sort of, the only way I can pay people back is to, uh, you know, just sort of let people know how well I was supported. And I think it's the best way I can pay people back to support me, just so that I like to think that, um, and it's a kind of sort, of a sort of a facet of prisoner support or a side effect people don't really think about, which is that, um, you know, there's people out there right now um, who are carrying out clandestine actions on behalf of animals. Um, and I like to think that when I get up here and talk about, hey, you know, I got real support in prison, that those anonymous people are out there somewhere, you know, maybe listening to podcasts, who knows, let me talk, you know, and they hear this and they know, you know, if they get caught, they're going to get taken care of. So um, I think that's a really great Thing. And that's like a really, you know, again, it's kind of a, one of the best ways I can pay people back, back for helping me out is just constantly putting out there how well I was supported. But um, I want to talk about, you know, as someone who's been a recipient of support, uh, what works, what doesn't, um, and, you know, just what prisoner support is at its basics, and then talk a little bit about prison if I have time. Um, so in a stripped down form, prisoner support really is. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's money in concert, so you can get vegan food, stay vegan in prison, uh, make phone calls and so forth. Um, it's books, it's visits, um, it's phone calls, you know, when things get rough and, you know, jails or prisons don't comply with things or they sort of infringe on your rights. Um, and um, the pretrial phase, um, it's money for a competent lawyer. Um, and really, uh, I would say, as important as that, is uh, everybody just keeping their mouth shut. You know, when people are in the hot seat, uh, people are facing serious charges um, and things are a little crazy like it certainly was when I got arrested. Um, you know, the feds are looking very closely at people and they want to know who's who and who they know and they're fishing for more information, they're trying to build a case. It's really important that all the associates that people, of that person kind of go on lockdown, uh, go on, you know, red alert status and, and keep their mouth shut. Just don't gossip. It's really easy. Um, so I think it's important to talk about what is the value of prisoner support for the animals. Um, you know, we're obviously, a, you know, strive to sort of, uh, you know, overcome speciesism and, uh, and uh, you know, this shouldn't just be about the people that are directly, the direct recipients of prisoner support. Why is prisoner support good for animals? And there actually there are several reasons. Um, one, like I said before, we cannot ask people to carry out actions, uh, illegal actions on behalf of animals um, if we're not going to be there to support them uh, once they get caught, uh, if they get caught. So that's very, very important. I think that... Um, you know, and like I said, I always try to speak out and let people know if, you know, whoever's out there, definitely no one in this room, but whoever they are, you know, you're going to get taken care of. Um, and second, you know, I, th I think that um, prisoner support and the stories of prisoners can be very galvanizing. They can really capture people's imagination. And I think they can be great outreach tools in a way. Um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people that wrote me when I was in prison and they'd say, um, you know what, I, I heard your story, I heard that you, you know, you did this, this, and this, and you went to prison and you did the time. And, and, um, you know, I feel like the least I could do is go out and protest the first door on the weekends. You know, if you're willing to do this, and I'm not saying it's, you know, the hugest sacrifice. I'm just saying, you know, people, I get these letters. Um, and I actually had a really fantastic conversation with a woman last night. She came up to tell me that, um, are people familiar with the Schumacher Furs campaign here in Portland? She told me that that was actually started um, um, as, uh, I think the first demo was done on uh, the day of my sentencing, uh, when I got sentenced in court. And um, that's how the campaign started. The people went out and decided to go out and protest the first door and just snowball and that first door eventually shut down. So I think that's a fantastic example of uh, how prisoner support can kind of uh, uh, be a good catalyst. Or, you know, at least the stories of prisoners can be a great, great catalyst. Um, so anyway, when I was in prison, you know, I received more mail than I could ever answer, more books than I could ever read, uh, more visits than I can accept. Um, and so I'm going to talk about what the best forms of support were in my situation. Uh, money for an attorney, you know, first and foremost, you know, that, that very literally could have meant the difference for me between two years in prison and ten years. Um, I got the two, it could have been the ten. Uh, I had people, you know, I had attorneys, uh, people raised money for me, and it was just absolutely fantastic. Thank you if you donated money. 
Um, so that was a, a great thing. Letters, I made some lifelong French, you know, friendships, I'm sure will be lifelong friendships through the mail. Uh, people that wrote me in prison, absolutely fantastic. Uh, money, I stayed vegan in prison, of course, um, but it was certainly made a lot easier. You know, I would have done it regardless, but it was made a lot easier uh, by the support I received and the monetary support. Uh, allowed me to buy, you know, some of the extravagancies of a vegan uh, federal prison commissary, like organic granola and uh, uh, soy chorizo and various things. Um, and I had phone calls. People really came through for me, you know, when there were certain times I was in a really bad situation, I was in a jail that simply would not comply with my request for a vegan diet, um, people would phone in jail. Um, and the best example I have of, of success uh, with that is I was in a jail um, in a Columbia County Jail uh, in Portage, Wisconsin. And um, they were simply not budging. They weren't giving me vegan food. And as a matter of fact, they weren't really giving me, any, me anything, frankly, that was edible. And um, it, it got to the point where I knew that I had kind of exhausted all of the uh, traditional remedy, you know, avenues you would go through for, uh, to remedy that. So I had to place a phone call and say, hey, can we get some calls to the jail? This is, I'm in a bad situation. Um, within about three hours of those phone calls coming in, um, I got called out of my cell. They brought me downstairs to the lobby of this jail in small town, uh, rural Wisconsin. And they brought me in this very plush meeting room. And they sat me down at this big oval table. It's a very nice chair. And across from, me, uh, across from the table was the, uh, the captain of the jail. Now this is a guy that you would never see, okay? He's totally inaccessible to the average prison. Uh, they sat me across from this man, and he had this very kind of, I don't know, defeated look on his face. And he had a pencil and paper, and he slid this across to me. And he simply said, Mr. Young, just make us a grocery list. Tell, tell your friends to stop calling, and we'll go to the grocery store every day and buy you whatever you want. <laughs> and I got to make a list of food, and, uh, and uh, they, he wasn't going for the hummus, he said, don't push your luck, but uh, <laughs> he got me peanut butter and, and produce and so forth, and I ate like a king for the rest of my time there. I was only, <coughs> only there for two weeks, but um, fantastic example of what phone calls can do. So please, if you hear anything comes down the wire, you know, hey, call this person, that, call the jail, they need support, this person's not getting vegan food, you're likely to think, well, what's a phone call to a jailer? Well, the fact is, uh, these people are terrified of, of scrutiny from the outside, so it does make a big difference. Um, and I, I guess the best form of support that I got, um, when I was in prison, hands down, above all everything else, I would have traded every letter uh, uh, for what I got um, in the form of ALF actions that were carried out, which were stated to be, in, you know, somehow in solidarity with me or in spread, whatever, whatever the case. Um, there were communiques that were issued of ALF, ALF actions saying, you know, that we did this for Peter. Obviously, it's for the animals, but you know, sort of a solidarity action. Um, there was a, a mink farm raid in Minnesota that was dedicated to whatever mentioned me. Um, uh, fox farm raid in Indiana. There was some, I think, on my birthday in Finland, a uh, first story got its window smashed out. Uh, things like that. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, like I said, I would have traded every letter um, for those, for those uh, more of those actions. So that is, that is prisoner support in the truest form. Without question. Um, and I think any, I don't know, I don't want to speak for everybody, I can just speak for myself, but I think, you know, ultimately the, what we want to see if we're, you know, if someone's in prison, they want to see other people picking up the slack on the outside. And that's, that's the best form of prisoner support right there. And I'll talk a little bit about the prison experience. Um, am I right? Yeah, but eight, ten minutes. Oh, God. Okay. Well, um, I guess in, on the subject of prison, ex uh, prison experience, I think it's important to realize there's an incredible spectrum of experiences that, that people are going to have in prisons. Uh, you've got state prisons, you've got federal prisons, uh, the cultures are very different, you've got uh, maximums and medi mediums and minimums um, within those uh, different categories. So it's, uh, there's definitely a spectrum there, but I think first and foremost what's most important is that we demystify prison as a movement. I think it's extremely important. Um, the fact is, right now, most of, the, most of the literature that exists about prison is written for voyeurs. It's written for people that want that sensationalized account of prison. They want to hear about the stabbings, they want to hear about this and that, and that stuff does happen. But um, the fact is, we don't have a balanced view of prison right now. We have the material written for voyeurs. Um, I, don't want to, I don't care about the voyeurs. I care about, you know, if there's someone sitting across from me and they're going to go to prison, and they're telling me, look, I'm going to prison for X amount of years, or you know, I just got indicted. Um, what would I tell them? And I certainly would not uh, fill their head, and, and nor would I fill the heads of anybody that's going to go out and commit, you know, ALF actions. I don't want to fill their heads with the horror stories. Um, I, I don't want to lie to them, but I want people to know that, you know, I want people to get a balanced view of what prison is like. Uh, the fact is, no one person can talk about the prison experience with <coughs> because there's so many different prisons out there. Um, 
But the bottom line is I think that when we talk about or focus solely on those horror stories, we really do the enemy's work. Um, because fear is all they've got. That's all they've got to hold over us. Um, you know, they, they can't, you know, like, it's like they said, they can't take our, our thoughts, they can't take our beliefs, they can't take anything. Um, they can't take away our ability to break the law, certainly. But um, they can uh, put fear in us and have us start policing ourselves. So um, I think it's really important that we avoid uh, instilling fear in people unnecessarily and just give a balanced account. Um, and we really don't do the animals any service by spending our time talking solely about just how terrifying prison is. Uh, there's so many myths with prison, and I, I really think the reason that so many people, people crack when they, uh, when they get arrested, and this, you see this in the Green Scare case, Operation Backfire. I mean, you had, I think the longest person, the, long, the person that held out the longest in that case was uh, Darren Thurston. I think he held out for like three or four months. Um, um, and you got, and it, it just seems absurd to me, or, or the average person, that why, why wouldn't you hold out just a little bit longer, wait for a deal, wait for something? Why would you just break in like the first day, the first week, the first month? Um, and I really think what it is is that people, they're sitting in county jail. And people don't understand that there's a, uh, people really don't understand the basic distinction between county jail and prison. Uh, how many people here have been arrested and spent just like even an hour in county jail? Um, okay, well, um, I actually, I guess interestingly enough, just popped in my head, but I'm uh, being here in Portland, but I, I spent my first county jail experiences right here in Portland. I got arrested at um, this hotel right over, I don't know where it is. If you hop a train out of Portland, you're going to ride right by it. I don't know, it's somewhere out in the northeast. But um, there's a hotel out there, and they're having a meat packers convention. I came down from Seattle. I dressed up like a cow. Uh, I was this PETA-sponsored demo. I got arrested. Um, got some good, me good media out of that, but I spent a few hours in jail. Anyway, that was my first experience. But people don't understand, you know, you're sitting in county jail. Let's say, you, whatever, you get arrested or something. You're sitting in county jail, and you're locked in your cell 24 hours a day. Um, your food comes through a slot in the door. It's extreme. The population density is unbearable. Um, you know, you're, uh, you're, it's, it's loud. Everything about it's bad. I mean, it's just as bad as it gets. Um, people don't understand that that's, that's, that's not where you spend your sentence. That's county jail. It's not prison. Um, people sit there and they're probably thinking, I can't do this for 20 years. I need to get out. You know, you might not be able to do that for 20 years. The good, you know, the good thing is you don't have to. That's county jail. It's not prison. When you go to prison, different world altogether. Um, and there's a chance it might be worse than county jail. Let's say if you had a really just insane case and you got sent to a max, you know, state prison or something. Okay, I don't know about that. But the um, fact is the average person, or person is going to have a much better time in prison than they are in county jail. Um, you get to go outside. The privileges are greater. More freedom of movement. Um, you know, there's a library. You rarely see that in county jail. Um, so they're just a list is endless of how prison is better than, uh, than county jail. Um, and I think that's what so many people crack. Um, one of my, you know, I always say about prison and survival strategy in prison to me um, was a lot more about communication skills than it ever was about, uh, you know, physical might. Um, and the fact is, that if you actually look at what most violence in prison, and this is not just coming from the prison I was at, I was at a pretty okay prison, uh, not terribly rough. There were fights. I didn't ever see them, but they, were def they definitely happened. Um, and there's people, you know, inside right now that are in much worse prisons than where I was, certainly. But if you talk to people that have spent a lot of time in prison, and even state prisons, they'll generally tell you the same thing. They'll say 90 plus percent of all violence in prison is totally avoidable. And you can break it down to a few things. It's like gambling debts. It's uh, gang warfare, you know, gang, uh, inner gang rivalry. Um, and you can really just, again, break it down to a, break it down to a few things, things that are easily avoidable. Um, the fact is, once I got sentenced and actually sent to prison, I only saw a single fight. Uh, I didn't actually see any fight in prison, but the only fight I saw after I got sentenced was at a federal holding facility, and it was a guy that got jumped because he was a snitch. Okay, um, you know what? If you don't snitch, you know, then you're not going to get beat up, so don't snitch. Um, but, you know, again, all this stuff's easily avoidable. Not all of it, but a lot of it is easily avoidable. Um, I think the, the amount of random violence in prison, at least in my experience in the federal system, is greatly overstated. Um, if you're reading the books, you're reading George Jackson or whatever, you know, political prisoner uh, uh, autobiographies, um, it, it's greatly overstated. Um, state prison, different culture. I'm not going to comment on it. I don't know. I've known people who have gone to state prison. I know what they tell me. Um, I don't necessarily feel comfortable passing it on because I don't know if it's true. Uh, what I do hear is that it's not as bad as they say. I'll say that much. Um, a lot of times. You've got bad prison systems. California is a bad prison system. Very bad. Um, I would not want to go to state prison in California. Uh, good news is that most crimes that are carried out on behalf of the earth or animals 
generally get prosecuted federally. Um, I think Jeff Lures would be the only example of, of, of a state prosecution that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, generally, the feds pick up um, politically charged cases. So um, when you go to the federal system, that's where you want to be. That's, those are the better prisons. Um, they call it Club Fed for a reason. Um, it's, not, it's not quite you know, Club Med, but it is certainly, uh, it's certainly a step above state prison. And um, you know, I, that's why I would say if you have to break the law, I would highly, strongly recommend that you break a federal law. Not this case. Um, having a politically charged case in prison is a really interesting thing. I found that it, uh, it benefited me in a lot of ways. First and foremost, um, having an exotic case I found in prison made me an, uh, really a conversation piece. Um, I, I met a lot of people very fast when I got to prison because when I started telling people what I was in for, they, they couldn't believe it. You know, they were, I told them, yeah, you know, I opened cages and freed some animals, and they, they dragged me all around the prison, you know, grabbed me, hey, you, I got to introduce you to this guy, you're not going to believe what this guy's in for. <laughs> and um, I got shuffled, shuffled, you know, shuffled all over prison that way, being uh, introduced as that, that guy that freed the animals, and people just couldn't believe it because it was so absurd. And um, so it, it made me a conversation piece, which was a tremendous asset, actually. Um, and, and I guess that's kind of, one of the, another example of how um, so much of, I guess, what you could call success in prison is actually totally counterintuitive. Um, in my experience, uh, actually being different and, and, and being sort of a, a aggressively ex a different in a very exaggerated way or something that I really tried to amplify, that was actually an asset to me in prison. Um, I found that if I sort of drew a line in the sand and said, you know what, there's mutual respect between us, but I'm not one of you, I found that I was not held to any kind of convict standard. Whereas a lot of guys that come in, they try to be down. Well, okay, you want to be down. Well, you, you know, they're going to make you down. They're going to make you, they're going to hold you up to their standards. You're going to have to get involved in this, this stupid, frankly, politics, prison politics, and so on and so on. If you're the guy that's a little bit different, you're, 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 you're social and um, you don't act aloof, but at the same time, you definitely let people know, you know, I, I don't do my time the way other people do time. Um, you know, I just want to read and do this. Um, in my experience in the federal system, people respected that. Um, it was actually an asset to me because I didn't get involved in the mix too much. I didn't have people, you know, when there were people, people would get together, uh, you know, it's, everything's racially divided in prison. All the white guys would get together to talk about some silly drama between them and the whatever, some other gang. Um, I was not invited to those meetings, and that's a good thing. Um, so I think asserting, you know, how different you are is actually an asset. Um, and I guess that kind of segues into another myth, I, in my experience, was that, you know, respect in prison is based on... Time's it? up, Mr. Young. Time's up. <laughs> can, I, can I give my last sentence? Absolutely. Do a little wrap-up. No. Okay. A wrap-up? <laughs> I have to wrap it? Wrap it. <laughs> it doesn't rhyme. Okay. Well, anyway, I, just, I always say that, um, again, I, was, I guess this is the way I started, but... Um, you know, if, if you're an activist, I think one of the most important things that you can do and we can all do together is just demystify prison. It's been a part of every social justice movement ever, people going to prison. Um, you can't just kind of like cut it out of the equation, tuck it away and not talk about it. It can't be an unmentionable. We have to talk about it. It's always going to be a part of this. Demystify it, get to know it, the, bad, the good and the bad. Um, and I just think when we do that, we definitely have one less thing um, between us and what we're fighting for. That's all I got. prisoner support campaigns for about 12 years. I actually worked on Peter's campaign when he was first arrested. Thanks, Andrea. And uh, I currently work on the Shack 7 support campaign and I've kind of been doing that since they were arrested. So I wanted to go over a little bit on how to do prisoner support from the outside, which is where most of us are going to find ourselves, hopefully. Um, but I don't want to go into a tremendous amount of detail just because it's tedious and ultimately a few of us are going to end up in that position. And if you do, there's plenty of resources online through you know, Compromise, Bite Back, and other websites to kind of find out the real concrete how-tos. Um, one of the things I always suggest to all activists is you never know when you'll be arrested, whether it be at a, de a demonstration or for something more significant like an underground action and you find yourself caught um, at Starbucks or something. <laughs> the Starbucks shows there is, thank you very much. Um, but it's important to memorize someone's phone number to call because you find yourself incarcerated and someone needs to know you're in there. No one's going to have any idea. 
potentially that you've been arrested. Um, and one of the important things to know when you are in a jail is generally you can't call cell phone numbers. Some jails you can't, some jails you can't, but usually you can't call cell phone numbers collect. So as fewer and fewer of us have landlines, it's important to have a landline number or two that you can call in case anything ever comes up. Um, it's really the only way to know. And in fact, when Peter was first arrested, um, it just kind of came through the grapevine that Peter Young had been arrested in the Bay Area. Um, and that day, like a couple of us left work and we're trying to figure out where Peter had been arrested at, um, where he was, what name he was under, and all kinds of other things. Um, and obviously, Peter was in a little bit different of a position as far as memorizing people's numbers. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind. So really, I guess the first step for a supporter um, doing a prisoner support campaign is when someone's first arrested, kind of figuring out what's going on. If you get that phone call or if somebody else gets that phone call, finding out where the person's being held initially, which is usually going to be at a county jail, like Peter talked about, um, and just figuring it out. And one of the things I found is a lot of people just don't feel comfortable making those phone calls, figuring out who to call, um, dealing with people in authority. No one likes to call the police and talk to them. No one likes to call the sheriff's department and talk to them. But it's really the only way to kind of find out what's going on. Um, so it really is a matter of just starting to call, call your, the county jail where you think the person's being held, you need to know their name, you need to know their birth date, and just try to track them down. The information that you're really going to want to get is when are they going to appear in court? What's their bail? What are they being charged with? Are they being charged with something serious where you should start working on getting an attorney as soon as possible? Do you have an attorney that can go in and visit these people? Um, what's the mailing address if you think they're going to be in for more than a day or two? Are there mail restrictions? Can they receive books? Um, are there letter limits? These kinds of things. Um, I guess the next kind of important thing is, although you may initially start dealing with someone's prisoner support campaign, uh, maybe they called you first, or maybe you were just kind of the person in the area, ultimately you have to remember that the prisoner should be ultimately in control of their support campaign. Um, they may decide that they don't want you to be their support, you need support person. They may decide they want someone else. They may decide they don't want a website. They may decide that they don't want their court dates published. And that kind of goes along with confidentiality. As a support person, you might learn a lot about the discovery in the case, the evidence against them. Um, you may learn things about them on a personal level or very kind of personal experiences they're having in prison. And just, I can't emphasize the importance enough, A, of just not sharing, obviously, the evidence against them with other people, but also, you know, you're kind of their confidant and not sharing that information and spreading it around. And of course, once you come on board as a prisoner support person, it's kind of a commitment for the long haul. Um, in the Shack 7 support case, we have people doing prison sentences of six years. So when you come on board, you're kind of signing up for the long haul or at least handing that responsibility over to people. So it's something that when you jump in, you're jumping in kind of head first and you're going to be there for a while. And you know, it gets tiring answering emails and dealing with making sure everyone's got their commissary money and taking phone calls and sounding chipper when you're having the shittiest day ever. Um, but it's just kind of what we do. Um, my partner's actually one of the Shack 7, and he's doing a four-year pr prison sentence. So I've had more kind of a personalized experience with dealing with incarceration and dealing with visits and things like that. Um, and kind of what I've learned from that, and Peter talked about this a little bit, is that visits and letters and all those things, just kind of interaction with the outside is really, really important. And I think um, our role as activists is kind of to remind them of what's going on on the outside, that they have a lot of support, and that can come in the form of letters, or like Peter said, doing actions is just as exciting for people. Um, I know from talking to the Shack 7 kids especially, they get more mail than they can financially afford to respond to, um, and time-wise, and just emotionally respond to, but writing those letters is still important. There's actually a prisoner support table on the table here. That's, I think been underutilized a little bit. People might not know what it's there for, but there's paper and envelopes and addresses for all the prisoners. There's postcards for the Shack 7 kids. Um, and just emphasizing, you know, writing letters to these folks is really one of the most important things that we can be doing. Um, as far as if you're getting into a situation where someone's going to be in prison for longer than a couple of months, you're really going to start developing a full-on support campaign. Um, and that can involve establishing a support fund if you're having someone you need to hire an attorney for, which is most often the case when we're talking about serious charges, um, you know, something more than six months or a year or so. Um, establishing a website, which is something I'm not savvy at, but it's really good to find someone in the movement who is. Um, you know, it used to be that we did everything through magazines and um, zines and newsletters and that kind of thing, but with the internet, websites are really kind of the ultimate thing. I'm sure a lot of you saw Peter's website. 
um, and just kind of keeping those things updating, updated, letting people know what's going on, getting flyers created, um, kind of organizing events to ultimately get the word out there. So um, I actually am not going to talk a whole lot more about organizing a campaign, because like I said, I think it, it's a position few of us will end up in, and there's a lot of information out there. I think we wanted to leave a lot of time at the end for question and answer about doing time or doing a support campaign or kind of what prisoners expect and need from us. Um, and then I just also wanted to mention that at the closing, which is at what, 3.30? Is it? Ends, and, at, ends at uh, 3.30 to 4.15. So at the closing tonight at 3.30 or this afternoon, I'm in room 228. We're going to do a big group photo and make tons of prints of it to send to all the folks in prison. So another motivation to come to the closing, um, and we'll do that big group photo. So hopefully you guys can all come to that. Definitely stop by the prisoner support table and get those addresses and write these folks. And I think uh, you're going to talk a little more about writing people and yeah. kind of things, so. Hi, I'm Chad, and I work at a local grocery store, and um, I guess the reason I'm talking on this panel is um, mainly becoming, from becoming friends with Josh Harper, we got myself and Emiko back there, um, became really involved in the Shack support campaign, uh, and on a local level are trying to be Portland's Shack support team um, and just recently became Josh's official support team. Um, and I guess over the last couple of years, uh, we've just really seen how important it is to keep it up and getting feedback from Josh in particular, how important it is to a prisoner. Um, so I just wanted to let people know how really important and how much you can do as an individual to make people's lives inside really much better. Um, the first thing, of course, that we were saying is letter writing. Um, and I would say if people are uncomfortable writing letters, like they don't know where to start, just look at it as you're trying to make a new friend. You don't have to impress them with some heavy political dialogue or um, yeah, just relate to them as a person and think of what that they're basically being deprived of all this normal social interaction, and you need to try to help bring that back into their life as much as you can through a letter. So, funny stories from work, you got diarrhea, whatever. <laughs> something just to make them laugh and break, you know, something to make them feel like they're hanging out at a coffee shop talking with you or something like that. Um, try to keep the downer stories, you know. Don't just write them and tell them your cat just died. Um, <laughs> you can talk about food stuff, but also be, don't just gush on and on about the new vegan milkshake card that opened up when you're <laughs> eating, uh, yeah, junk. Um, when writing, uh, it's all specific to where everybody's staying, but yeah, just before you start, um, look at their support sites or look into what the rules are. They can get in trouble by what you write, so don't, you know, write all over the envelope and all these things like, you yeah. know vegan revolution and all that. Those things I've heard have been used as like gang, they, they can think of it as gang affiliation kind of things or inciting something. And it's just better to play it safe and keep it personal and try to make their their day better. Um, I would say uh, there's lots of local things you can do. Um, have a letter writing part of your house. There's, it doesn't require any resources on anybody's part. Have five friends over and hang out and write ten letters each postcards, anything. Um, I think frequency is a, a nice thing, even if it's just a little note saying, hi, I was thinking about you. People always have a stack of mail coming in every day. Um, all the social networking sites, um, MySpace, things like that, putting out bulletins, just like, oh yeah, just saying, keep these people in mind, you know. There's like constant reminders you can do to help people out that take, you know, just a minute of your time. Um, and also if you start writing people and you don't hear back as often as you'd like, keep in mind the scarcity and the value of stamps and time. Not so, not so much time, but stamps are often a commodity traded in jail and you only have a very finite amount. Um, and it's not that they don't want to write you back, they just might, it might take them a while. Keep writing. Um, after you get, if you get, if you hit it off with them and they're in the neighborhood, like Josh is an hour away in Sheridan, um, you become buddies, maybe you can get on a visitation list or on an approved phone call list where they can call you and vent or just talk about movies or whatever. Um, but you'd have to fill that out, just fill that out on an issue by issue basis, whether you hit it off with somebody or not. Um, 
also if you feel up to it, there's lots of easy fundraiser options to keep their support funds full, you know, just easy little bake sale things to movie nights. Um, get in touch, like if you're in Portland and you have an idea, you can get in touch with us at our store and we'll help you out with all the details. And it's nothing's as hard as it seems it might be to organize something. Um, yeah, just be creative and try to, I think, keep it personal and just try to bring some normality back to their life so they're not just surrounded by jerks all the time. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it for what I would say on a, on a personal level. Um, you can do it. It's really easy and it's really important. So, get to writing. Thanks. Question. Any questions about support or prison? It's usually such a hot button. Yeah. Oh, uh, did you make any like friends, prisoner friends, or like did you? Do you like sit alone at lunch or like, I was just wondering, I didn't know how that works. Or do they give you your food That was yourself? high school, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, made friends in, uh, I made friends in prison, sure. I mean, I had a lot of acquaintances. I didn't get too close to anybody in prison. Um, the kind of, the clique I kind of ran with was like the people that hung out in the library, or like the prison li or law library specifically. It's kind of, a, it's kind of where the, a lot of the people that I can relate to most seem to, seem to gravitate towards. So I hung out there a lot, and I, I mean, I knew, I knew everybody, I mean, everything's very racially divided, so when I say I knew everybody, it really just means I knew everybody that was white, uh, it's just how it is. Um, I knew a lot of other people as well, but um, I pretty much knew everybody, people knew my name, um, like I said, it's kind of the conversation piece thing went a long way, so I, um, I made friends, definitely, and there's actually a few guys, um, best story I have, a um, few guys that I've gotten out that I've maintained touch with, best story I have about that is I got a guy, true story, um, I got a, I got a, uh, a guy who, uh, he got out of prison like a week before I did. And he was a, um, I'm just going to throw it out there, he was a porn film producer. <laughs> and um, so he gets out and a year goes by and I, I check a, 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 my MySpace profile and he had messaged me um, a year later. And he said, get in touch, we have, to, we have work to do. <laughs> and, now it's not we, now that was my thought too, but that's not what happened. Um, as it turns out, um, this guy was not a vegetarian or anything. Um, he, he expressed concern for animals, but that was the extent of it. And he used to sit, sit down and ask me and say, "What? Tell me about your movement. Tell me about your movement." And I thought he was looking for like a new target market or something. So <laughs> I didn't really tell him a whole lot. But I guess something I said sunk in because when I wrote back, I actually looked at his MySpace profile before I wrote him, and there was a blog and it said animal cruelty. And I read, and I clicked on it, and it said, "I just like to remind everybody reading this." And by the way, this this is a profile for his porn film production company. Um, it said, "I would like to remind everybody that animals are being killed in the most you know, egregious ways every second of every day." And I would like everyone to take a second and stop and think about it. And below it, it said, "The net, our, the proceeds for our next film are going to go be donated entirely to uh, uh, organizations that are fighting animal cruelty." And this guy wanted to get touch, and he simply wanted to ask me, "Where can I donate this money? This can, where it's going to be used effectively from this porn?" <laughs> and it's in the works. So. And I don't, I'm not, it's not an endorsement of porn, it's an endorsement of giving money to animal rights <laughs> So I'm not enabling this project in any way. So. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for Chad. Uh, there's a lot of rumors about prison and things that go on, and, and I just wanted to set, see if this one could get set straight. Um, was Josh really in prison with MC Hammer's next man <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not sure if he's out now. Um, yeah, it's true. Well, he was in a and he was in a Hammer video, not Josh, but, but no, the guy. Yeah, he's also in jail with some guy who was on the Bloods vs. Crips banging on wax record, and, and he was just been hanging out with Jay Adams, one of the original Dogtown skaters, was in jail in Sheridan for some kind of stupid meth thing. And they, they got to reminisce about old skating stories. So that's the best thing about federal prison, you meet a lot of celebs in there. Seriously. That's where, that's where all the celebs go, honestly. But you also meet lots of really shitty people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to say that it was interesting that Peter was saying that um, for him it was really important that people did direct action while he was inside there. And I'm wondering, in y'all's experience, because you know, in my experience, it seems like a lot of folks, um, maybe more ELF action kind of folks, are kind of discouraging that. And so, um, just wanting y'all to explain. I mean, I think there's just, the discouragement comes from the kind of Jeff Lures example, where right before his sentencing, people went out and um, 
set so much of these on fire in Eugene. And that certainly, in a lot of people's opinions, including Jeff's, I think, contributed to the kind of draconian sentence that he got. And I think a similar example happened recently with Brianna Waters, although I don't know how much it impacted her sentencing. But for the most part, when I, with all the prisoners I think I've ever dealt with, they're psyched when they hear about direct action once they're in prison. Um, you know, I think attributing it to them can and can't be bad depending on what their legal situation is. If their case is resolved and there's no appeal outstanding and not a potential for resentencing, like the Shad kids are appealing, they can potentially be resentenced. So I don't know that attributing an action to them would necessarily be the best thing. Um, but hearing about that stuff and knowing that, you know, you, whether it was, you know, Peter Liberating Mink or the Shack Kids or other folks that were doing the environmental actions, knowing that you put all this time into these actions and then are sitting in prison for that many years to know, I think, that other people are continuing on the fight and that what you did wasn't, I mean, it wasn't in vain regardless, but it was part of building something more for people to be inspired by and take action it makes a huge difference to the people inside. They really need those morale boosters because, you know, if they hear, oh, not much is happening on the outside, it's like, what am I doing sitting here? Then why did I make these huge sacrifices? You know, so everyone else can rest on their laurels. So I think those things above ground and underground are absolutely critical, definitely more so than letters. Yeah, I talked to Josh a couple days ago and about the conference coming up, and he's yeah hearing the excitement in his voice that he's like, I'm going to get out, and I just like the excitement of getting back involved and knowing there's like this whole new group of people and like all this new blood in the movement. Is a, just hearing about things like that, even as, as it mundane as it might seem, is like, oh, well, there's all these new restaurants and there's just all these new people moving to town and people are getting active. Like, those things all just really bright, brighten up your day. So. Who's the next prisoner that will be released? Um, in the Shack case, the next person that will be released is Andy Stepani, and although his legal situation is currently up in the air, actually these postcards are slightly inaccurate because Andy just got moved um, to the middle of the country to a penitentiary where Daniel McGowan's being held, and we're not really sure kind of what's going on with him, but it, um, Andy's next to be released. Well, Andy and Josh. Andy and then Josh. Yeah. Um, you were saying that you made friends through the mail that were lasting friends, and like you're saying, sometimes if you get to be friends with someone, you could go visit them. So once they start to feel like your friend, it is tempting to tell them, you know, downer things or, yeah, I haven't done anything recently and I need to get on it. But are you saying, yes, they might feel like your friend, but still restrain yourself in what you say because the main point is to support them and, and say what benefits them more? Their I think you just judge it by your relationship you build with them about what you want to talk about you know once you become i'm just saying like first letter you send don't just make about how horrible yeah. the world is and despair yeah I, you can build into that like i plenty of times talked to josh about bummer stuff and blow him out and i realized i have to stop but yeah you, it's just like any friendship except that one friendship you gotta warm you gotta feel out a little bit more it's, it's behind bars I think having a natural interaction with people is important. And I, I think kind of what Chad was talking about probably is often like I'll hear from one of them that they got some letter from somebody who was like they've never even written before and they're like, and then I got hip surgery and my cat died and they described this like horrible death of their cat, like literally like five different awful things. Anyway, I hope you're doing well. You know, and you're like, right, like, okay. Lots, <laughs> you know? lot, lots of cat deaths. Yeah, lots of animal deaths. Yeah, pictures too. Yeah, don't send cat pictures. Don't send cat pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, I, I mean, she'll back me. I had a stack of letters, probably this side. Pictures of none of the cats. The inside joke now is to send our friends pictures of cats. <laughs> <laughs> Amika? No, I just wanted to comment on that. Yeah, just because people think just because they're in prison that they're so deep in despair that you, you could be their, like, partner in despair and they'll <laughs> understand since they're so sad you could be sad with them and they'll totally understand they don't I mean you don't really want to hear that <laughs> you know so I mean we have a hard time we're having bad days mm -hmm. and we visit Josh the whole to not you know not tell him mm -hmm. stuff that's bad it's happening in us but you kind of have to yeah. Anybody? One more. Come on, bring, bring. <laughs> <laughs> Tough questions. Uh, I was once told um, by Josh about Jake that Jake 
who listens to Kid Rock. <laughs> and that's unexcusable, uh, I'm sure you all agree. So, <laughs> so there was some confusion, because Josh was saying, yes, Jake does listen to Kid Rock. Jake, I confronted about it, and it was very slippery. And I was just, as his partner, I was just wondering, where are you staying in the Kid Rock? Kid Rock would be a deal breaker, I have to tell you. <laughs> No. One thing people should know when they're with Josh is he likes to tell tall tales he lies. <laughs> about other people. <laughs> he's, got, he's got a campaign from the inside to make everyone think that Pete Will Potter is an active rollerblader. <laughs> <laughs> like, that goes by the name of Soul Grind. So, any chance you see Will walk around, just be like, Soul Grind. <laughs> and, know, and then write Josh and tell him that, and he'll fucking flip out. <laughs> <laughs> it's a way to connect with Josh. Yeah. Like Don't write to Jake about Kid Rock. He won't be stoked. <laughs> He's got a reputation. Right. <laughs> <laughs>